little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but to the point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome to We Need to Talk About on GB News with me, Alex Phillips, where we get stuck into the issues that we need to be looking at in depth. Nothing is off the table and nobody's going to get cancelled for saying exactly what they think. Keep me company today is Benedict Spence, political commentator and friend of the show. And here's what we've got coming up. It was a predictable Partygate packed PMQs with Sakia Starmer now demanding the Prime Minister pull his populist punches against the BBC and the Archbishop. We'll get into the nitty gritty of it all. Can Ukraine prevail? The latest on Putin's bloody campaign. And if only we still had vomitoriums. Be prepared to reach for the sick bucket as we review Prince Harry's latest sit down for American TV. That's what we're talking about for the next hour, but what do you need to get off your chest? Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. But first of all, it's time for the GB News headlines with Rosie Wright. Good afternoon, it's just one minute past two. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date today on GB News. The Labour leader has accused the Prime Minister of sending the Conservative Party into disarray after the Prime Minister broke coronavirus lockdown rules. At Prime Minister's questions, Sakir Starmer said, The party of Churchill has been reduced to shouting and screaming in defence of a lawbreaker and called on him to resign. But Boris Johnson hit back, reiterating his apology for breaching Covid rules by attending a party in the Cabinet Office during lockdown. Professor Neil Ferguson broke the rules. He also resigned. The Prime Minister said that was the right thing to do. The former Health Secretary broke the rules. He too resigned. The Prime Minister tried to claim he sacked him. Why does the Prime Minister think everybody else's actions have consequences except his own? I, I thank the right honourable gentleman. I, I feel he's in some kind of Doctor Who time warp. We had this, uh, we had this conversation yesterday, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I've, ex I've, ex I've explained uh, why I bitterly regret uh, receiving an FPN. I, I, ap I apologise uh, to the House, uh, but he asks about the actions for which I take responsibility, and I'll, I'll tell him we're going to get on uh, with delivering for the British people. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been formally issued with an extradition order to the US by Westminster Magistrates Court. The 50-year-old is wanted in America over alleged conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defence information. He's always denied the allegations. After just a seven-minute hearing, the case will now be sent to Hope Secretary Priti Patel to decide whether it should be approved. More than 5 million people have fled Ukraine since Russia launched its attack. That's according to the UN Refugee Agency. Now, meanwhile, Russia issued another deadline for Ukrainian and foreign fighters to surrender at the steel plant in the besieged city of Mariupol. Ukrainian commanders, though, have vowed not to give up the final stronghold in the city. Ukraine's deputy prime minister says they've reached a preliminary agreement with Russia to open a humanitarian corridor for the first time now in three days. Western allies of Ukraine have agreed to send more weapons to help the nation defend itself. It's after a phone call with G7, NATO and EU leaders. The UK, Germany and Canada pledged to send heavy artillery support to Ukraine. 
Now, despite Russia's withdrawal from the north of the country, the UK's Ministry of Defence has warned there is still a risk of strikes against what they're calling priority targets throughout Ukraine. A man's been given a suspended sentence after admitting to sending a grossly offensive video of a model of Grenfell Tower being burned. Paul Bassetti pleaded guilty at Westminster Magistrates Court to filming the footage at a bonfire party in November 2018 and then sharing it within WhatsApp groups. He's received a 10-week jail sentence suspended for two years. Prince Harry says the Queen was on great form when him and his wife, Meghan, visited her in Windsor last week. Speaking to NBC News Today programme, the Duke of Sussex said he wanted to make sure Her Majesty was protected. It's just so nice to see her. You know, she's on, she's on great form. We always, she's always got a great sense of humour uh, with me and I'm just making sure that she's, you know, protected and got the, the right people around Well, you, you make her laugh. That's what she always says. Uh, I, did you do it again? Uh, yes, yeah, I did. Uh, both <laughs> Megan and I had tea with her, so it was, it was really nice to catch up with her. And, you know, home, home for me now is, 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 you know, for the time being, it's in the, it's in it's the, in States. the States. The full interview will air later today on NBC News Today programme. Now, a man's been jailed after hitting speeds of up to 150 miles per hour during an 80-mile police pursuit. Video has been released showing a banned driver in a police pursuit stretching from Bedfordshire to the West Midlands. 25-year-old Saeed Reza has been jailed for four years and two months. Users of self-driving cars could legally be allowed to watch TV and films behind the wheel under proposed changes to the highway code. The Department for Transport says the new laws would make insurance companies rather than individuals liable for accidents while the self-driving vehicle is in control. The updated code will make it clear that drivers must be ready to take back control of vehicles when needed. You're up to date on GB News. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now we'll be back to Alex. You probably won't know this because nobody reported on it. But one year ago, the Joint Committee on Human Rights said that every single fixed penalty notice issued under COVID regulations should be reviewed. Over 100,000 of them. The fines, a ridiculous 200 quid for not wearing a mask to 10 grand for organised gatherings, forced people to cough up or face criminal prosecution. With Downing Street getting 50 fines and counting for partying during lockdown, that could total half a million pounds. But the real rub is that there was no way whatsoever for ordinary folk to appeal them. Horrible, tyrannical stuff. But get this, of those that did end up in court, for the brave few that weren't terrified and tried their luck, a third were found to be incorrectly issued. Not only that, the regulations changed at least 65 times during the period they were being cruelly dished out, meaning most of the time police had no idea what was allowed and what wasn't. The penalties breach a whole load of human rights, from no punishment without law to no unjustified interference to family and private life. In fact, the committee stated... The Coronavirus Act was so misunderstood and so wrongly applied that every single charge was brought incorrectly. Given Boris himself is now opining he didn't get the fact that he was breaking his own laws, it's time every single one is refunded and an official apology issued for turning the UK into a despotic regime. Well, we're joined by our political correspondent, Tom Harwood, who's in Westminster. Now, Partygate, of course, came up a lot in a rather pugilistic uh, PMQs, and MPs will be asked to vote tomorrow, won't they, on whether the PM should face a standards committee? 
They certainly will. It will be a pretty seismic vote. Of course, yesterday, uh, the Speaker approved a motion from Sir Keir Starmer, which will, of course, allow members of Parliament to vote on whether or not uh, the Prime Minister is referred to that committee, of course, chaired by Labour MP Chris Bryant. Uh, it looks like it's pretty certain that there's going to be a strong whipping operation. Some say it's already underway amongst the Conservatives to vote that motion down. But we did hear the word of that motion today and it lists four times that the Labour Party is accusing uh, the Prime Minister of potentially misleading Parliament in saying that he believed that the rules were followed at all times and in saying that he was assured that the rules were followed at all times across Whitehall and in Downing Street. Now, it wasn't that much of a surprise to people listening that Sir Keir Starmer kicked off Prime Minister's questions today at midday with yet more questions on those parties. Let's take a listen. Allegra Strachan laughed at breaking the rules. She resigned. The Prime Minister then claimed he was furious at her behaviour and accepted her resignation. Professor Neil Ferguson broke the rules. He also resigned. The Prime Minister said that was the right thing to do. The former Health Secretary broke the rules. He too resigned. The Prime Minister tried to claim he sacked him. Why does the Prime Minister think everybody else's actions have consequences except his own? I, I thank the right honourable gentleman. I, th I feel he's in some kind of Doctor Who time warp. We had this, uh, we had this conversation yesterday, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I've, ex I've, ex I've explained uh, why I bitterly regret. Uh, receiving an FPN. I, I, I apologise uh, to the House. Uh, but he asks about the actions for which I take responsibility. And I'll, I'll tell him we're going to get on uh, with delivering for the British people, uh, making sure making sure that we power out of the, the problems that COVID has left us, and more people in work than there were before the pandemic, Mr Speaker, fixing our energy problems and leading the world in standing up to the aggression of Vladimir Putin. Those are all subjects about which I think he could uh, reasonably ask questions now. I mean, it seems to me uh, typically unedifying behaviour on both sides, but how did it all go down in the chamber? Yes, it was interesting. Looking at the Conservative benches, there was a greater sense of unity uh, on these issues than there had been uh, before. Certainly lots of supportive questions uh, on those benches of the Prime Minister. But, of course, a raucous chorus from the opposition benches, clearly uh, not accepting the Prime Minister's plea to move on to other issues, saying that he uh, felt like he was in a time warp then, a Doctor Who-style time warp, of course, because many of these questions were addressed yesterday in that chamber at length. Indeed, questions taken from across the House on just those issues. But, uh, of course, the Prime Minister was saying that uh, the, the leader of the opposition to some extent wasted his six questions focusing uh, on parties. Whether or not people at home would have thought that, clearly it's an issue that is very salient with the people of Britain. But of course the argument of the Prime Minister, as it has been for several months now, is that there are pressing concerns at home and abroad. Mentioning, of course, his uh, talks with world leaders and indeed President Zelensky, uh, talking about the fact that later today the Prime Minister is flying to India, of course, where he hopes to uh, go further on in terms of our trade talks with that country, but also a security partnership and hopefully bringing them closer to the side of the West when it comes to the Ukraine situation as well. Clearly, a lot on the plate of this Prime Minister. Of course, as well, domestically, that cost of living crisis continues to rumble. Was it the wisest choice of the Leader of the Opposition to continue pressing on Partygate? Well, that remains to be seen, but clearly, in the minds of many, there are other issues too. Tom, thank you ever so much. We're joined now by Edwina Curry, writer, broadcaster and, of course, former Conservative MP. Edwina, I have to ask, do you think that the way that Boris Johnson has dealt with all of this has been uh, good, responsible, edifying? Or are you a little bit disappointed at the constant seemingly wanting to wriggle out of taking any responsibility? Uh, well, I speak to you, Alex, having just come back 
from uh, having my fourth jab. And um, I have to tell you that I'm very proud of the way this government has conducted itself and getting the whole vaccine program up and running and all the work that's been done. You know, there's, a, there's a whole host of other things going on. Watching Parliament today and uh, watching the uh, Prime Minister's questions, it was pretty unedifying spectacle. But I couldn't help feeling that, you know, if anything happened to, uh, uh, to Sir Keir Starmer, we'd end up with Angela Rayner as the possible future Prime Minister. If I have to make a choice, then I think I'd much rather have Boris um, whatever he's been up to with Partygate and all the rest of it. I really think Partygate has been done to death and people are sick and tired of it. And it really is about time that we moved on to debate and talk about some of the many other issues that face us. Yeah, I mean, in, in many respects, you're right. I don't think the general public have necessarily moved on. Though. I think there's still a lot of ill feeling towards the prime minister because it seems to me that he just doesn't really want to accept culpability. And the excuse that there's pressing issues at home and abroad, well, he is the prime minister for crying out loud. Of course, there's going to be pressing issues he has to deal with. But surely that's exactly the reason we need to have faith in him. And especially we need to have faith in his character and his integrity. Well, yes, I, I hear what you say, but let me tell you this, Alex, an awful lot of this is still about Brexit. A lot of this is people trying to get rid of the Prime Minister who didn't like the Prime Minister in the first place, who have never forgiven him for Brexit, uh, and who are determined to replace him with somebody who would be much weaker on Brexit, uh, who have forgotten that he won a general election with that as the main issue uh, only two years ago. Uh, and yes, of course, it would be wonderful if we had a saint with a halo and wings sprouting out of his back and who's, who'd never, ever put a foot wrong. But what we've got in Boris is a real-life human being. And, uh, yeah, he makes mistakes. But on the big issues of the day, and I would add to Brexit and I would add to recent conduct of the pandemic. I don't agree with what you said about uh, lockdown. I would add to that uh, Ukraine. I mean, my grandmother came from Ukraine, so I'm watching it day by day. And our prime minister, our British prime minister, is leading the vanguard in getting arms and heavy weapons to the Ukrainians to make sure that they can fight off the Russians and do it, do it on our behalf for freedom and democracy right through Europe. I totally agree with you about the UK's fantastic performance when it comes to leading the vanguard against Russia uh, and, and, you know, with that invasion of Ukraine. But we don't have a presidential system, do we? The, the prime minister doesn't act in, you know, a completely unilateral manner. He has advisers. He has government departments behind him. And whoever is leading the country would surely pick up where Boris Johnson has left off. Oh, I don't think that follows. I mean, if you think about it, Alex, uh, the previous Prime Minister, Theresa May, was quite a saintly character. And when it came to Brexit, she was absolutely useless, which is why in the end, it took three years, she was replaced. Uh, the party just couldn't put up with that uh, any longer. And no sooner was she replaced that within a matter of months, we had a general election and we returned with a whacking great majority. And that actually, that matters. That matters, it seems to me. I mean, you open your, your sentence with yes, 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 and then you go, but. I don't do any buts. I don't like what happened in Downing Street. Uh, I think many of those civil servants and those advisors should have been thinking a lot harder. You make the rules for other people. You make those rules for good reasons. You make those rules to try and save lives and to emphasize over and over again that we were facing a lethal contagion, the like of which has never been seen in living memory before. That's why you made the rules. And that's why they should have said, no, we're not having any parties. You want to have a party? You go to a pub. Oh, the pub's shut. There's a reason the pub's shut. Go home. That's what they should have said. That's what, should have, that's what they should have done, but they didn't, did they? Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Edwina, it's always wonderful talking to you. And I'm, I'm glad you managed to calm your dog down a bit as well. Thank you ever so much. And we'll speak to you again soon. Joining me on the show today is political commentator Benedict Spence. Benedict, you know, do you feel like if he had apologised sooner, the British public are kind of understanding in many respects. And do you think that if he had brought out that mea culpa sooner or at least made some sort of significant gesture, mm. like, for instance, what I said in my introduction, repaying the fines that everyone else has been issued, yeah. that he would be in a better position. It's the wriggling, it's the squirming that is just totally unattractive. I do, and it's, it's interesting when people say it was only a minor infringement to the rules. Well, that actually makes the initial dodging of the issue all the more egregious, because as you say, actually, he could have come out and said, yes, you know, it was minor, but I did do it, and I'll accept the fine. It was the fact that he lied 
to Parliament uh, and said that he hadn't done that and lied to the nation and said that he had no knowledge of this. Oh, oh, and then it turned out he did, and he's still trying to wriggle his way out of it. There were many opportunities that he could have come clean, he could have been honest, and he didn't. And as you say, actually, you know, the idea of reimbursing the fines, you know, many, many fines handed out to people would have been a great goodwill gesture. He can't do that now because he's accepted his own fine. That actually would have been the better option, but now he can't do it in hindsight. But I do think it's very interesting what Edwina picked up on there, which is, you know, it's all an effort to unseat the Prime Minister because it all comes down to Brexit. And I do think there is um, some reality to that. I think a lot of people who support the Prime Minister through thick and thin do so because of Brexit, and they rightly fear that somebody who might replace him might be a little bit softer on the issue, maybe try to row it back. But Brexit was about sovereignty, and sovereignty means accountability. It means a move away from an attitude, a culture, where politicians, be it in Europe or Westminster, were able to do things without any scrutiny, get away with it, and just wash their hands and say, oh, well, there's nothing we can do about that because Europe deals with that. And then Europe going, ah, oh, well, that's, that's just what the Commission says we have to do. You know, that was the idea. We were going to move away from that style of politics. What the Prime Minister has done is essentially go back to that style of politics and go, well, I can get away with anything because I'm the Prime Minister. That's wrong, fundamentally. And yes, it's fine to say we're worried that a, that a pro-Remain Prime Minister might, might replace him. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, he's had his opportunity and he's failed on the most fundamental principle. There'd be a great job for you, number 10, advising the man. I'll tell you that, Benedict. You're with GB News on TV and radio. Coming up, we'll reveal the staggering number of migrants pulled from small boats in the English Channel already this month. That's after the break. But first, let's get a check on the weather forecast. Hello, I'm Luke Meyer with your forecast and we've got plenty of fine and sunny weather to come over the next few days and for this time of year still fairly warm as well. Now the reason for that is we've got high pressure centred just over Scandinavia but it's still close enough to the UK keeping these weather fronts out in the Atlantic at bay and there's very little wind across the chart at the moment as well with those isobars spread out so lots of fine and settled weather. So through the rest of Wednesday as you can see a lot of sunshine to come for most of us. There will be some fair weather cloud bubbling up across parts of England and Wales through the day. That may just spark one or two showers for South Wales and the South West but for most of us it's set fair through the day and temperatures could reach 20 degrees today. That's 68 Fahrenheit. Now we will see a little bit more cloud filtering in across the east coast of Scotland. Low and misty cloud here as well, so a fairly grey picture to come here. But otherwise, for most of us overnight, it's set fair as well. You can see these weather fronts staying well out towards the west. So for some of us, a little bit of mist and fog forming overnight. A chilly one as well. Temperatures getting down to low single figures in rural spots. Could be a touch of frost across Scotland and northern England. But that does set us up for another largely sunny day through Thursday. Fair weather cloud will bubble up at times through the day and the sunshine may be turning a bit hazier down towards the southwest. I think through the afternoon we may see a bit more cloud developing across the central part of England and Wales but for most of us once again it is set fair. Those temperatures doing pretty well for the time of year but notice that easterly breeze developing along those eastern coasts and that is going to make it feel colder here and we could see some low cloud drifting in at times too. More especially then as we go through Thursday night and into Friday more of this low misty cloud pushing its way in off the North Sea. Those easterly winds strengthening so more of us will see cloud as we head through Friday, especially across the eastern and southern parts. I'll see you soon. Take care. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News.
Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. More than 2,000 people have been pulled from small boats in the English Channel in the first three weeks of April. On Tuesday alone, UK authorities intercepted 263 people who were spotted on board seven small vessels. GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White has been following the story and joins me now. Mark, what is the latest? Afternoon, Alex. Well, everything looks to be on course for another record year of small boat crossings. Uh 6,700 people have been pulled from about 200 odd small boats in the English Channel. Now, of course, if you do some extrapolation, you think, well, three times uh, the first four months of this year, that doesn't get you to the 28,500. Uh, people who crossed the English Channel last year, but it doesn't work like that. These first four months of the year are clearly the wildest months in terms of the weather in the English Channel. And there are days, many days, the majority of days when it's just not suitable for these small boats to come across. So the fact that we are now at a figure of uh, just under 6,700 people who have crossed the English Channel in what is uh, the first four months of the year. That is far higher than it was last year. It shows that we are uh, on course now to be well ahead of the 28,500 who crossed last year. And yesterday, uh, border force, uh, controlled now by the Royal Navy, were out there in force. The lifeboats also involved in picking up some 263 people who were on seven boats trying to cross the channel. It's not so calm out in the channel today, uh, so only one attempted crossing. But as the weather improves later in the week, we can expect again many more to try to make that crossing. I mean, by this point, we're all very familiar with the government's plans to start sending some of these illegal migrants or migrants who are accessing the UK illegally over to Rwanda for processing. My understanding is Denmark are also now in talks with Rwanda to try and employ much the same policy. Yes, and I think that news will be welcome as far as Boris Johnson and Priti Patel is concerned. Uh, there has been a great deal of criticism from uh, MPs, politicians across the political spectrum, as well as human rights groups about this plan to send the majority, really, of those who cross by irregular routes, so those crossing in small boats and in the backs of lorries, across to Rwanda and what would be a one-way ticket uh, to that country. And if they are then granted asylum, their new life would be in Rwanda. They would not be able to return to the UK at that point. Now, the government says that it doesn't believe this is cruel and inhumane. It is, they believe, the solution that will break the model of the criminal gangs. Because if there is no uh, chance of uh, the majority of people being settled in the UK, then that business model that they're selling to these desperate asylum seekers is somewhat diminished. That is at least the hope of the UK government. And now perhaps the Denmark government as well, who've confirmed that they are indeed in talks with the Rwandan government. 
Mark, thank you ever so much for the updates. Mark White, our Home and Security Editor there. Well, joining me on the show today is political commentator Benedict Spence. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? There's been a whole lot of outrage and then people mm. welcoming this and cheerleading it. And I've always had big question marks over whether this is actually going to be enforceable legally and yeah. whether the, the, the planes are actually going to take off for Rwanda. What's your take on this? I mean, I think it's very interesting that Denmark has now got on board, given that Denmark went through a very interesting phase of inviting tens of thousands of Syrian refugees in, then trying to expel them by saying that regime held parts of the country were safe, but was unable to deport them because it didn't recognize the Syrian government. So it was left with many thousands of people in detention centers and not quite sure what to do with it. I imagine that's a, at least part why Ru uh, Rwanda has uh, come onto their agenda. I think the difficulty is you've got to look actually what the, you know, how the model of you know, people trafficking and refugees and all that sort of works. It's always very unsavory people who profit, be they gangs in Calais, be they gangs in Turkey, be they gangs in Libya. Um, all this is doing is simply moving uh, the profits from one group of unsavory people to another, the ones in, which is the government of Rwanda, which has uh, an incredibly poor record on human rights, much better than, than it used to, obviously, but is still accused of making political opponents disappear, of funding an insurgency in neighboring Congo. If anybody believes that this situation will be solved by sending people to Rwanda, they are woefully underestimating uh, the state of affairs in that country and the fact that many people who go to Rwanda will just end up in the chain of human trafficking right back up through Africa to Libya and probably then try to end up in Europe again. And that's the best case scenario for those people. The worst case scenario is, of course, that they are left in Central Africa with no ties there and no real ways of escape. I think it's deeply inhumane. And I understand what a lot of people are saying. It's a way of sort of trying to you know, put people off. But we don't actually need to do that by sending people to a country like Rwanda. There are overseas territories that the UK has. There are other facilities that we could use. And as you say, you know, I think that there are just better ways, probably more legal, legally upstanding ways than doing this, as much as it may seem very popular. Benedict, thank you. You are with GB News on TV and DAB Radio. Coming up, Prince Harry has all once again opened up on US television about his visit to the Queen last week. We'll hear what he had to say. Sick buckets at the ready. That's after the break, but first, let's have a little look at the news headlines with Rosie. It's 2.30, I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date. The Labour leader has accused the Prime Minister of sending the Conservative Party into disarray after he broke coronavirus lockdown rules. At Prime Minister's question, Sir Keir Starmer said the party of Churchill has been reduced to shouting and screaming in defence of a lawbreaker and called on him to resign. But Boris Johnson hit back, reiterating his apology for breaching Covid rules by attending that party in the Cabinet Office during lockdown. More than five million people have fled Ukraine since Russia launched its attack. That's according to the UN Refugee Agency. And meanwhile, Russia issued another deadline for Ukrainian and foreign fighters to surrender at the steel plant in the besieged city of Mariupol. But Ukrainian commanders have vowed not to give up the final stronghold in the city. Ukraine's deputy prime minister says they've reached a preliminary agreement with Russia to open a humanitarian corridor for the first time now in three days. More than 2,000 people have been pulled from small boats in the Channel in the first three weeks of April. UK authorities intercepted 263 people yesterday who were spotted on board seven small boats. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been formally issued with an extradition order to the US by Westminster Magistrates Court. The 50-year-old is wanted in America over an alleged conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defence information. He's always denied the allegations. A man has been jailed after getting up to speeds of 150 miles per hour during an 80-mile police pursuit. Video footage has been released showing a banned driver in a police pursuit stretching from Bedfordshire to the West Midlands. 25-year-old Said Reza has been jailed for four years and two months. You're up to date. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus radio. Shortly, we'll be back to Alex for We Need to Talk About.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Putin's big push to snatch a scalp in Ukraine is intensifying, with Ukrainian troops saying that in beleaguered Mariupol, they are now outnumbered 10 to 1. The Battle of Donbass in the east is also raging with heavy bombardment as President Zelensky again desperately appeals for more weapons, more munitions, more money, more help. Last night, EU nations, the US and UK, all gathered to discuss how to do more, many sending missiles, tanks, even promising jets to help Ukraine repel the enemy invasion. All at that point, except, of course, Germany, who even prevented a defence manufacturer sending tanks to the brave nation. Although it seems Germany has had a change of heart in the past 24 hours. Meanwhile, an American spy plane was seen over the Black Sea around the time the big Russian warship, the Moska, sank, leading many to project that the United States may have helped to locate the vessel, enabling Ukraine to strike it. A move that Russia perhaps could have shouted about NATO escalation had they not rushed out propaganda that it went down due to a fire on board. It's also been revealed more than 20,000 Russian troops have been killed in the conflict, an eye-watering death toll for Putin. Could it be that finally it's all beginning to unravel for the Kremlin's monster? We're joining me now on the show is Mercha Babu, who's a journalist that's been reporting on the Ukraine conflict since the beginning and is a dear friend of this programme. Mercha, fantastic to have you back on. Uh, again, a huge amount of attention is being focused on getting civilians out of Mariupol. What are the prospects of that happening, do you think? Well, thank you for having me. Good to be back, Alex. Uh, I myself was in Mariupol at the beginning of the conflict and I evacuated on the last day before the city was surrounded. And even back then, to me, riding those buses with alongside um, residents of Mariupol, for all of us, it seemed impossible at the time that we will make it out alive. I can imagine that now, with Russian troops being in control of well over 90% of the city, at least that's what we're seeing on, on social media and on uh, the official Telegram channels, of uh, various uh, local politicians, I think that um, for for the local residents, the remaining ones, it's it's almost impossible to uh, have a safe road out of the city. Although we've been seeing negotiations over humanitarian corridors, and one just uh, as you previously mentioned, uh, scheduled to uh, take place in 
in the next 24, 48 hours, I can not see that happening in a safe way, given that they've been in the past constantly bombed, shelled, and threatened. On the other hand, we have to think about the people who remained already. Those are probably, and this is just my guess, spending some time there, people who either have no choice, no social mobility whatsoever, or they choose to remain thinking they are safer under the pro-Russian uh, control or regime of the city. It perhaps shocked a lot of people when Russia decided to strike Lviv in the west of Ukraine, near the border of Poland. Um, have we heard any more of how the situation is developing there? We're talking a lot about the intensified fighting in the east and the battle of the Donbass and, of course, Mariupol. But what is the situation currently like in the capital, Kiev, and, and, and in the west of Ukraine? So uh, we, we've been talking to sources on the ground, other local journalists. We've been following uh, a so-called live Ukrainian map of the conflict. Technology helps us journalists on the ground to keep updated in real time with um, various places because Ukraine, as, as obviously you and your viewers know, it's a massive country. So I can be in one place and a lot of things can happen two, three hundred miles away from me. But like I said, thanks to technology, I, we can keep up with that. What we're seeing is, is at the moment, uh, an intensified uh, shelling in the eastern Ukraine. But from time to time, we do see these alarms going on on our mobile apps in Lviv, in Chernivsky, in border towns, meaning that they could be possibly shelled or striked by the Russian army. I take personally that as a, more of a symbolic threatening than anything else. I think Putin wants to send a message to Ukrainians that nowhere is safe and also to the humanitarian corridors and to the military aid convoys getting in through Poland, through Lviv, getting in from Romania, getting in from various places that these convoys are under surveillance and they could be targeted at any point. So they're not massive in terms of um, uh, casualties or damage, but they are symbolically very powerful, these shellings taking place in uh, cities like Lviv or other border cities. Mercia, it's always fantastic talking to you. You are a brilliant journalist and it's always a pleasure having you on the programme. That's Mercia Babu there, who's a friend of this show. Joining me now on the show is former Ukrainian journalist and army officer Viktor Kovalenko. Viktor, I mean, again, we've heard a lot more weaponry, munitions going to Ukraine, but it, when you look at Mariupol, where, where the soldiers are saying they're being outnumbered 10 to 1, is it going to be enough? Can the Ukrainian resistance start turning the tide? Uh, thank you for having me on your show. Of course, uh, ammunition is never enough, and uh, it's never enough to have more weapons. And I hope the West will reconsider uh, and uh, and will send uh, and will continue sending arms and ammunition and spare parts for uh, to repair um, uh, arms uh, for Ukrainians. Uh, but I see uh, optimistic signs today uh, regarding the Russian offensive, which started three days ago. Since it started, uh, Russians didn't uh, reach any success there, and they didn't broke uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, defense lines in the east, in Donbass. And I see uh, that Russians, they use a lot of um, propaganda and intimidation um, towards Ukrainian defenders and Ukrainian society, um, creating the picture, fake picture, that Russia, uh, that Russia will uh, occupy Ukraine, and Ukraine has no choice but surrender. And I think the situation on the ground is absolutely different, and Ukrainian army is um, is doing very well, and, and they build uh, good um, good defense lines, and they use uh, modern tactics of combat. And I'm impressed with that. And I I think Ukrainian army will um, hold the ground. It was support from the West, but this support should be intensified. 
I mean, people have speculated that uh, because I think it's the 9th of May is Victory Day in Russia, Putin wants to be able to declare a victory somewhere, somehow, something that his people can celebrate. Is there not the risk that, you know, there's already a 20, allegedly a 20,000 troop death toll for Russia, but Putin doesn't seem to be lifting off the, the gas at all, does he? Is there not a concern that this is just going to go on and on and on and they'll almost become a stalemate because Putin will continue to double down? Of course, we should expect that uh, uh, Putin and his inner circle, they will double down on Ukraine to get some kind of victory. And you know, Russians, and it's it's coming from the Soviet times, they also, they like uh, the specific dates like uh, Victory Day in May. So they try to present to their uh, society some kind of victory. And I think they need to grab some kind of land in Ukraine to present it as a big victory. But we know that this is not actually true. And uh, Putin is in a difficult situation right now. He doesn't have what to present as a victory. And uh, my concern, my big concern, that he will not only double down, he may use the mass uh, uh, weapons of mass destructions, like chemical weapons or limited nuclear strikes. and. We should be uh, uh, vigilant and should not um, be naive about uh, his future steps. Fascinating talking to you. We're definitely going to get you back on the program. That's Viktor Kovalenko, who's a former Ukrainian journalist and army officer. Well, let's go back now to political commentator Benedict Spence. Benedict, first of all, let's, let's bring it back to the West situation in all of this and this vault fast by Germany, because last night it was being reported that once again, mm. Germany was saying, we won't send armaments to Ukraine. Money, yes, armaments, no. And they'd even blocked a German defence manufacturer from providing Ukraine with more advanced tanks than they currently have. But apparently, they might have changed their minds. Yes, they're not actually. Uh, the Netherlands is going to be sending an artillery system, uh, the PHZ 2000. Uh, the Germans have said that they'll provide art, um, ammunition for it and also training in Poland to Ukrainian operators. So it is a slight shift uh, in stance, but you know, pretty much throughout this entire <laughs> escapade, Germany has sort of borne the brunt of a lot of the anger from across uh, much of the rest of the world for standing in the way of you know sending uh, tanks, munitions, anything that could be of any sort of use. Um, yeah, and there's a myriad reasons for that. You know, I mean. Uh, Germany, we have to remember, from basically the start of the Franco-Prussian War until the fall of the Berlin Wall, Germany was just about the most tooled up country in the world through over a century. There is a sort of a psychological need, desire to demilitarize. And I think it's something that the German public haven't necessarily got over. There is also, of course, the war guilt of what the Nazis did in Russia. Um, so you can sort of understand why the German public themselves have just not been uh, enthusiastic in the way that a lot of, say, their eastern neighbors, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, have been very keen to and munitions because it's just a very different way of looking at the world. But I do think very slowly, partly at the behest of their eastern neighbours, they are being dragged further into the conflict. There is an understanding, actually, that this isn't one that they can just sit out of. Uh, because as, as much as anything else, Germany is supposed to be the leading voice in Europe, and it risks sort of having that wrenched away from it, certainly on the military front, by the th certainly three of the four Visegrad countries, and to a lesser extent the Baltics, who are now setting the stage, along with the UK, which has left the European Union, about how the West needs to confront uh, Russia. And on that front as well, there's been from the beginning a very tentative approach by NATO to not be seen to be directly involved in mm. this conflict. Arm Ukraine, yes, provide uh, resources, financial resources, sanctions, but not actually directly intervene. But we seem to have learned that a US spy plane took off from Sicily yeah. and flew over the Black Sea and could potentially have been directly helping Ukrainian forces to take out that big Russian warship. What does this mean? Uh, I mean, realistically, what does it mean given that Russia has already claim that it sank in a storm. Possibly nothing. It would be very embarrassing for the Russians to then turn around and go, oh, actually, our Black Sea flagship was sunk by the Ukrainians. That would be you know, a complete loss of face. Um, but you know, th there's no question that it does look a little bit suspicious. It's not just any old spy plane. It's a P-8. It's used for hunting submarines. So you know, it's, it's not going to have no problem uh, finding a gunboat like that. Um, whether or not that would lead to sort of a Russian retaliation against NATO countries, I wouldn't have thought so. But it will certainly, the sinking of the ship in of itself will lead to an escalation within Ukraine, um, as we've already seen, you know, the shelling of uh, Lviv and other places that are not part of the, you know, the, the Donbass conflict. Um, certainly, you know, there is, we all know there's no love lost between NATO and Moscow, uh, so I don't think it'll change anything like that. 
Moscow already knows that NATO is doing everything bar put troops on the ground or planes in the sky um, directly over Ukraine. So, yeah, I don't think they'll be surprised by this. Benedict, thank you ever so much. Oh, my favourite topic. What on earth is the Duke of Montecito all about now? That from his ivory towers in California, he wants to make sure his nan, the Queen, is protected with the right people around her. What is she? Some wayward pensioner about to be dragged to beer pong in a Nazi uniform or bunga bunga parties with Andrew? A Tsarina so indoctrinated by Rasputin that the entire royal family is set to fall? As far as I can tell, the thing she needs protecting from most is him and his shameless wife's desperation for attention. That no sooner have they had a private parlay with his family, some fawning journalist is commanded to capture the lot of it in a tawdry cry for continued relevance. I wouldn't be surprised if part of the Jubilee celebrations is throwing the pair of them off the royal balcony into a sea of bunting. Harry also avoided a question about missing his family on the NBC interview earlier today. Take a little look. You miss your brother, your dad. Look, I mean, I'm, for me, at the moment, I'm here yeah. focused on these guys yeah. and these families and giving everything I can, 120% to them, mm -hmm. to make sure that they have the experience of a lifetime. Oh, well, joining me now is our very own GB News Royal Correspondent, Cameron Walker. And still with me, of course, is political commentator, Benedict Spence. Oh, we watched this together, didn't we, oh, Cameron? We did. Oh, we loved it. Yes. So what are your big takes from that interview? Do you know, it's really funny, Alex. Two days ago, I was talking about having the old Prince Harry back. Him at the Invictus Games, which he founded. He's a former Afghanistan veteran himself, supporting troops with their rehabilitation through, through sport. And yet this interview, to me has opened a whole other can of worms by doing another interview with the US television network. Um, we know that he has had a bit of a troubled relationship with uh, William and Charles. He met Prince Charles very briefly on Thursday at Windsor Castle. We're told it wasn't a very long meeting, which I think perhaps speaks volumes. Yeah, and he, again, he peddled out the, the, the favourite line they've nicked from the Queen about a life of service, didn't he? Yes, yes, he did, he did indeed. And, and I think, you know, Prin, uh, Prince Harry wants to go to the Jubilee celebrations. He said so himself that he would, he would like to go, but I think there's a bit of an issue with security. So should we have a look at that clip? Let's no, look at that clip. Back. That, back. Well, we did. I think after a certain age, you get bored of birthdays. You do? You think she's bored of her 96? She won't so. be bored of the Jubilee, will she? Uh, no. Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> she's, had a, she's had a few Jubilees now, so every, everyone's slightly, yeah. every, everyone is slightly different. But yeah. I think she, I'm sure she's looking Do you think to you'll come? I don't know yet. There's lots of things with security uh, issues and everything else. So this is what I'm trying to do, trying to make it possible that you know I can get my kids to meet her when GB News technology refuses to play the sort of nonsense Harry talks about. I mean, there was a very penetrating question about, do you miss your family back at home? And he kind of completely avoided that. But he also said some, something kind of seemed to me pretty wacky about how difficult it is working from home in sort of cramped conditions. Yeah, he certainly did, didn't he? And then we need to remember what his home is now. And it's an £11 million Montecito mansion and I'm sure as we all know from horrific stories of the pandemic and lockdown most people perhaps didn't have that luxury so I think it's going to be dubbed as a little bit out of touch I think. I mean, it also begs the question of what apparently is his job. But I mean, this is all clearly being done for Netflix. It feels like the same old, same old. When will the guy learn his lessons? Why couldn't he have just said to that croaky American journalist, oh, when's he going to start doing that? I'm from California. Why doesn't he just say, I'll talk about the Invictus Games, but no questions about the family? Well, we don't know. But we know that, of course, he's got a Netflix a documentary crew following him around at the Invictus Games. And perhaps it's his chance of perhaps staying relevant by continuing to talk about his family back here in the UK, the working senior members of the royal family. We know, like I said earlier, he wants to be at Trooping the Colour. There were reports he has been invited to stand on the Buckingham Palace balcony during those Jubilee celebrations. But he was talking about security. We know he's suing the Home Office for not allowing him to pay for his own personal police protection when he's in the UK. Um, but And he wants to bring his children there as well. He wouldn't have the same police protection. In, his US security team, even, sorry, would not have the same legal powers in the UK. They wouldn't be allowed to carry firearms and they wouldn't have access to the same intelligence. But... He's in the Netherlands at the Invictus Games, where presumably he's not going to have the same level of protection there 
either. So I think it's opened a lot of questions, uh, and I think we'll just have to see how the family perhaps responds to Prince Harry continuing to do these kind of interviews. If they respond at all, I like to think they're classier than that. Cameron, thank you ever so much. Well, for tiggerish misanthropes like me, today has provided so much catharsis I can be smugly satisfied for at least a week. Boris has squirmed, Harry has whined. Today's news is the gift that keeps on giving. But fear not, as I have trawled through all of the papers to find us even fresher material to lambast. Turn the volume down and clutch a protective cushion, for I'm about to unleash my mirth. It's time for the Alex Agenda. Some horrible character has paid $50,000 to slay Botswana's biggest elephant, with the country's ex-president, Ian Karma, great surname, taking to Facebook to condemn the act after his successor lifted the ban on trophy hunting in 2019. The banal argument for this sickening blood sport is basically, well, if rich moron morons don't get to part with lots of cash to gun down a glorious beast, some other criminal ne'er-do-well will do it instead. Based on that flimsy logic, and given the number of people who would want to see a grisly end to this evidently overprivileged sick brute, I would propose an eBay auction to allow the highest bidder to hunt him down. Although I don't condone murder, not of man nor beast, at least releasing him into Quando to be chased by an angry paying international mob would probably raise a lot more for the local economy than heartlessly felling such a noble creature. Posh celebrity chef Gizzy Erskine has cooked up something pretty admirable. She has slammed people who claim to have mental health issues just to look cool. She was referring to ADHD, something she herself suffers, and says people on some sort of narcissistic journey of self-discovery into the landscape of their mind are clogging up the NHS and preventing people with genuine needs from getting the treatment that they require. But we all know it doesn't stop with ADHD, does it? It's almost as if society today actively demands we all delve into our deep recesses to expunge some sort of condition, from gender dysphoria, which of course is the latest problème du jour, to the now slightly dated obsession with OCD. I mean, if you don't have a therapist, ya, yeah, there must be something dreadfully wrong with you. The biggest mental health crisis of the 21st century is the fact that everyone seems to think they have a mental health crisis. Well, political commentator Benedict Spence is still with me. We've got lots to discuss. Mental health, Harry, trophy hunting. What are you going to go for? I mean, oh, good Lord. Well, actually, no, what would you prefer? Because I was just going to say well, mental health. That, that, that's, only, that's only because I'm a political commentator. So let's, by let's, definition, let's there. there must be something mentally wrong with me. So actually, no, let's go for the trophy hunting thing instead. OK. Let's do what, that. If, are you one of these people who thinks that trophy hunting can be good for the economy, blah, blah, blah? Yeah. <gasps> I find nothing more repellent than the idea of wanting to shoot an animal like that. But the fact of the matter remains is that these animals were in many parts of Africa almost hunted to extinction by poachers for you know, their ivory. Botswana is actually a really good example of how conservation can bring their numbers up by protecting them because it gets the local communities more um, in line with wanting to protect the animals themselves because they stand to reap the benefits when a few are culled at the end of the year by trophy hunters. And if you want to take away a foolish rich American's money to let them kill an animal that's probably going to die within a year or two anyway, because it's always animals at the very top of the pile that haven't got long left anyway. If you want to do that, I say, all right, it's revolting. But if, if that is what helps keep you know, these animals' populations up and broadly in check and helps to protect a lot of those parts of the world, then, yeah, I'm in favour of that. Um, it, you know, different when it's an animal like the rhino, for example, which is critically endangered. But Botswana is not lacking in elephants like it once was. You know, it, I think that that is something that needs to be managed very carefully. But actually, yeah, I'm, I'm OK with it at the end of the day. Oh, Benedict, you heartless <laughs> man. Well, that's all we have time for. But join me again for We Need to Talk About on GB News, same time, 2 o'clock tomorrow. Coming up next, it's The Briefing with Darren McCaffrey. First, it's time for the weather forecast. Hello, I'm Luke Meyer with your forecast and we've got plenty of fine and sunny weather to come over the next few days and for this time of year still fairly warm as well. Now the reason for that is we've got high pressure centred just over Scandinavia but it's still close enough to the UK keeping these weather fronts out in the Atlantic at bay and there's very little wind across the chart at the moment as well with those isobars 
spread out, so lots of fine and settled weather. So through the rest of Wednesday, as you can see, a lot of sunshine to come for most of us. There will be some fair weather cloud bubbling up across parts of England and Wales through the day. That may just spark one or two showers for South Wales and the southwest, but for most of us, it's set fair through the day. And temperatures could reach 20 degrees today. That's 68 Fahrenheit. Now we will see a little bit more cloud filtering in across the east coast of Scotland. Low and misty cloud here as well, so a fairly grey picture to come here. But otherwise, for most of us overnight, it's set fair as well. You can see these weather fronts staying well out towards the west. So for some of us, a little bit of mist and fog forming overnight. A chilly one as well. Temperatures getting down to low single figures in rural spots. Could be a touch of frost across Scotland and northern England. But that does set us up for another largely sunny day through Thursday. Fair weather cloud will bubble up at times through the day and the sunshine may be turning a bit hazier down towards the southwest. I think through the afternoon we may see a bit more cloud developing across the central part of England and Wales but for most of us once again it is set fair. Those temperatures doing pretty well for the time of year but notice that easterly breeze developing along those eastern coasts and that is going to make it feel colder here and we could see some low cloud drifting in at times too. More especially then as we go through Thursday night and into Friday more of this low misty cloud pushing its way in off the North Sea. Those easterly winds strengthening so more of us will see cloud as we head through Friday, especially across the eastern and southern parts. I'll see you soon. Take care. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubry, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides.